Now we're at lesson seven, the great ministry in Galilee. This is where we pick up um, the great ministry in, in Galilee. And it's going to start in John chapter four. We're going to be in John chapter four and we'll begin with verses 43. Um, so we're going to, to deal with the great ministry in Galilee. The first thing we're going to encounter is the healing of the whose son? The nobleman's son, the healing of the nobleman's son. Now, after a brief stop that, that Christ had, Jesus had to stop in Samaria. He then returned to Canaan in Galilee. So picture that. He had a brief two-day stop in Samaria. Now he's returning to, to Canaan in Galilee. And he's bypassing his hometown of Nazareth. Now, why is he bypassing his hometown of Nazareth. This is the answer. In John chapter 4, verse 44, he's returning to Canaan and Galilee. He bypasses his hometown in Nazareth. Why? Right? Because John 4 and 44 says, he himself had pointed out that what? So Jesus had come to his own, his own were not receiving him, and he's saying, I am passing Nazareth because I have a ministry to reform, and yet right now, where I'm at, a prophet is not respected in his own land. So as he's in Canaan, as Christ is in, in Canaan, Jesus was approached by a, a nobleman, and this nobleman came to Christ and pleaded for him to heal his son who was located in Capernaum. So this nobleman comes and says, Christ, I need for you to heal my son. Well, do you know what a nobleman is? Yes, a government official. A nobleman was the person of a court who was appointed to the service of who? Herod. Of Herod, the who? The Tetrarch. He was an official attached to the what? Highest ranking official in the So the nobleman was someone who was well-connected, right? It was someone who, who was um, well-connected to, uh, to Herod. So the nobleman, he comes to Christ because of the fact that his son is, is ill. And so Christ, he sent the nobleman back home to Capernaum with this promise. He said, when you go back, your son's going to be healed. Now, this is what's interesting about this. The servants met the nobleman while he was on his way home. They met him to tell him that his son was healed. But watch this. They met him to tell him the son was healed at the very time that Jesus said that his son would be alive and would live. This tells us that the word of Christ is always on time. The word of Christ is always on time. He's telling him he's going to be healed. At the very time that he says he's going to be healed, what happens? The son is actually healed. And because of the second miracle that took place in Canaan, John chapter 4, verse 53. In John chapter 4, verse 53, it says, then who? The father. The father that's the nobleman. The father did what? He realized what had happened. He realized what had happened. That Y'all sounded like a broken record. <laughs> All right, that was the exact time. The what? Became what? Believers. Became believers. Y'all, isn't it amazing how God's word is always on time? Yes, with his faith. And because of his faith, that faith was then transitioned to the family. Sometimes it just takes you and I having faith to be able to then tell others how good God is so that our families can be saved. And this tells us this happened at the exact time it needed to happen. Sometimes we get impatient because some members of our family may not be saved, may not be acting right, acting crazy. How patient was God with us when we were acting crazy? So we ought to be patient and wait on God's time because none of us is God. 
but it will happen on his time. But while we're going through the process, we're going to continue to have faith. This nobleman went through the process having faith. And as a result of him having faith, his son was healed and his family was saved. You see this ministry that Jesus has? The power of his ministry? And that's why we're walking through this understanding what he's able to do because what he did then, he's able to do now. He's able to do now. So we see that, that this journey that we're taking, it went through Capernaum. And as he was there, you had the noble man's son who had been healed. Now we're going to look at his move to Capernaum. Matthew chapter 4, verse 13. We're going to read verses 13 to 17. I'm, I'm sorry, y'all going to read it. Leave him, leave him what? He went. So he's leaving where? Nazareth. The place where the prophet is not, without any respect and went to live where? In Capernaum, so his ministry is shifting, and which was by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali. Verse 14. So he moved from Nazareth to Capernaum to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. What was said? Verse 15. Verse 16. See what's happening now. From what? From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So I wanted us to, to read that and see that the ministry is shifting now to where? Capernaum. To Capernaum. Now, Capernaum, during Christ's time, it was a thriving city. It was a thriving city that was located on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And I had a... but. We see in Capernaum, something interesting happens. There's a man named Matthew, and Matthew has a job. Matthew has a job, and he was in charge of the customs. He held a position of a customs official in Capernaum. Do you know what the custom person does? The, the customs people, what do they do? They check, see what's, what the imports are. They, they check it, but then they also collect taxes on everything that comes through. So if there's something that's coming in, I'm going to tax you. Not only do goods have to come through here, but now I'm going to tax you on those goods. Now, there were two important trade routes that came through Capernaum, and this made it an international trade. So there was a lot of stuff that came through Capernaum. Um, Egypt was in the south. Egypt was in the south, and Damascus was in the north. And so these were areas in which you could see that this is a port. So there was a lot of stuff coming through, a lot of taxes were being collected. So that meant Matthew was a tax collector. And he was also very rich. rich. <laughs> he was very rich and, 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 and wealthy. Now, unfortunately, the once thriving city of Capernaum, today, it lies in ruins. It lays in, in it, it, it's in ruins. And Jesus actually prophesied this and said it was going to be in ruins. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 23, the city that was great, the city that was great, now is in ruins. What does he say? And you, hold on, will you be lifted up to the skies? Will you be able to be lifted up to the skies? No. You're going to fall apart. Verse 24. You can see what can happen when you turn away from God and you start valuing possessions more so than you do Christ. When you start God, those things that are built up, they can be destroyed in a moment's time. They can be destroyed in a moment's time. Luke chapter 10, verse 15 says the same thing. I don't have it on the screen, but it says the same thing. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? 
No, you will go down to the depths. This just helps us to see that you can have a thriving economy. You can have a thriving nation and turn your back against God. And God can make everything go down in ruins. This once great city, great city, Capernaum, now lies what? Now lies in ruins. That's a message for us. So Jesus is, is his ministry is starting to grow and he's educating and sharing with people and teaching and training and developing them. And we find that with his ministry, most of his ministry took place where? Galilee. In Galilee. If you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you would think that after the arrest of John the Baptist, that that was extensively where his, where his ministry was. You would think that it was in Galilee. However, much of the Gospel of John, when it's recorded, where, were, where was the setting for that? Judea. At, in Judea. Are you following me? Okay, at this point in Jesus' ministry, at this point, he begins to um, emphasize the kingdom of heaven and the need for repentance. At this time, he begins to, to emphasize that. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. You see, we're staying with Matthew. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. What? Repentance. For the... Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. What does Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 say? Okay, now hold up. So, Jesus' ministry is continuing. John, who was the forerunner, who was preaching in the wilderness, remember, he got locked up. So, after he was put in prison, Jesus' ministry then went to Galilee. And when he went to Galilee, what was he talking about? Okay, verse 15. The time has come. The kingdom of God is? Do what? And do what? Now here's a question for you. What does the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven mean? What does the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven mean? What does that mean? Home. Home. The, the presence of God. That God will what? That God will rule. The, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God was not a new phrase to the Jews. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God was not a new phrase to the Jews. The kingdom of heaven simply remains God's absolute rule. God's absolute rule. The kingdom of heaven focuses on God's rule over the earth. Over the earth. And you know what? That was the, the Jews' deepest dream. That's what they longed for. They were longing for the time that God would rule over the earth. They were longing for that. They dreamed of the day when God would have absolute rule. And so Christ, he says, when he's helping to explain the kingdom of heaven and he's helping to explain the kingdom of God, he declared that repentance is the basic requirement for entering where? into entering into God's kingdom. What does repentance truly mean? To turn away from and to, to stop and to what? And to turn to God. To turn away from. Literally, it's a change of mind. It's a change of mindset. Not about individual plans, intentions, or beliefs. But it's a change in the whole what? Personality. Personality from a sinful course of action to? Now, we can ask for forgiveness all we want. When we ask for forgiveness, we know God loves us so much that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to what? Forgive. 
forgive us of our sins, and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He's a forgiving and loving God. But to enter into the kingdom of heaven, it's not just about forgiveness. We got to do what? Repent. We have to turn away from that lifestyle. And we have to have a change in our whole personality. And we change a course of action and completely turn around and follow God. Now, does that mean you won't, that you're never going to sin again? No. But guess what? At least now your focus is on following God. And each and every day you're trying to get closer and closer and closer to God. So the important thing to enter into the kingdom of heaven is we have to repent, not just say, I'm sorry. Because, see, a lot of times we'll mistake God's patience for permission to continue to do the things that we've been doing. And we don't want to live a holy life. And, and God says, no, I need for you to repent, not just to ask for forgiveness. So remember, Jesus is coming to a world. And as he's coming to this world, all this evilness is around and this wickedness is around the world. So he's wanting to make sure that he comes to clean this world up. He's coming to clean it up. So this is his his. This is his, his, his move and his shift in ministry, talking about you have to repent. And just as it was important to repent then, it's just as important for us to repent when? Right now. Right now. Right now. now, this is interesting as well. He talks about repentance. Now he goes and starts calling some disciples. Some disciples he starts calling. Matthew chapter 4. Verses 18 to 22, Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 20, and then Luke chapter 5, verses 11, 1 through 11. These talk about the calling of the disciples. So let's start with Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. As Jesus was walking where? Again, where's his ministry at right now? In Galilee. He saw who? Simon So what did he say? Uh-oh, hold on. I missed the verse. What verse 22? It disappeared too. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, okay, let's go, Mark. Let's keep going. Mark 1, 16 to 17. Y'all's throat getting tired, I can tell. <laughs> so we see the account from Matthew. We see the account from, from Mark. Now, let's go to Luke.
Okay, I know y'all had a lot to read and a lot to dissect. But for the sake of um, capturing this, Matthew and Mark talked about Jesus calling four people. So we had Simon Peter and his brother, Andrew. Then we had James and John, sons of Zebedee, also known as the sons of thunder. Now, this is the key thing I want you to, to realize. Jesus' ministry is in Galilee. Um, he's calling those to repent. He goes out and finds men who were fishing and in an occupation. As he goes, and he then presents to them the opportunity to follow them, follow him, what do they do? Stop what they're doing and what? Follow and follow him. They stopped what they were doing and they were following him. What God is showing us is when Jesus is calling us, we need to stop what we're doing, allow him to have our full attention, and then do what he says to do, which is follow him. It first starts by following him. And as you follow him, he said, I'll make you fishers of men. The assignment I have prepared for you, if you follow me, I will equip you for that assignment. These men had been fishing for fish, had never fished for men. But he says, if you will just follow me, I'll equip you. And I know we've heard this before. God does not call the qualified, but God qualifies those who he's called. And if God has called you, he will give you everything that you need to complete the work that he gave you to do. And as we're following him, obedience is so important. There was a shift in Luke. In Luke, we had a shift because it wasn't just about following him. He got into one of the boats. The boat belonged to Simon and asked him to put a little for the shore. Then he sat down and talked to people from the boat. When he, Jesus, had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water, let your down for a catch. He's telling Peter what to do after Peter has decided to follow him. Simon Peter answered, Master, we what? We went work all night and fished by the night and haven't caught he give him an excuse. We've been working. We've been working. He had a conversation with Jesus to let Jesus know, did you not see what we were doing? But because you say so, I will. This makes no sense to me. We've already been in the best part of the fishing season for the night. We let down the nets, and we didn't catch nothing, Jesus. Nothing. But because you tell us to, I will let down the nets. When he had done so, as soon as he was obedient to God, they caught such a large number of fish that what? Y'all, when you trust God, when you have faith in God and do what God assigns for you to do, even if it doesn't make any sense for, to you, know that God is able to not only bless you, but to bless you so much that you can't even handle the blessing. The nets began to break, but it gets better. So they signal for their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled what? So for the what? Amen. Don't you know that when you trust God, not only do you get blessed, but those that are connected to you can be blessed as well? And that's why I just want to stay close to those that are following God. Because the closer I stay to those following God, I know that if he's blessing you, I just want a little bit of the, the overflow. That's all I want. I don't got to have a, I don't even have to be on the cup. I can be the saucer. Or I could just be the floor. As long as it spills over, I just want whatever it is he has. If both of them begin to sink. Then when Simon saw this, 
He fell at Jesus' knees. He then repented. Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. I doubted you. I doubted you. He fell, and all of his companions were astonished as the catch of the fish were taken. And so were the sons of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Jesus said to him, don't be afraid. From now on, you will what? He repented. Jesus looked at him and says, I've even got greater things for you. Because you caught all these fish, but now you're going to catch something even more valuable. And I'm preparing you for that, and this is part of the process. God is preparing each and every one of us for something great if we trust him through the process. So we got to do as the disciples did and keep what? Following him. We keep following him. Keep following him. So Jesus called his disciples, and guess what? He's calling you right now. He's calling me right now. Are you listening to what he's saying to you? Are you waiting for him to order your steps? And then as you hear what he's commanding you to do, are you ready to take that step of faith and do what he's assigned for you to, to do? We went from, what just happened? Called, called his disciples. What did they do? They obeyed. As they obeyed, what happened? Caught a lot of fish. Not only did they catch a lot of fish, but they were prepared for their future ministry because they were being prepared. Jesus says, I've been trying to teach and train and develop you about the importance of following me. So now I'm going to continue my journey. As he continues his journey, right, um, now we're going to go to Jesus delivering the demonic. In Mark chapter 1, verse 21 to 28. Jesus is, has now, and his disciples, they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went where? To begin to, you know, anytime Jesus went into a town, the first place he looked for was a, was a synagogue. Um, it's important for us, when we go to different towns, we ought to look for a place where we can be able to worship, where we can gather together and worship. The people were amazed at his what? Because he taught them as one who had, not as the, verse 23. Then, just then, a man in the synagogue who was what? By, what did he do? He cried out. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy, one of, the Holy One of God. What does Jesus say? And what? Come out of. What happened with the evil spirit? Verse 27. What is this? A new and with he even what? Then what happened? Okay, this same account is found in Luke chapter 4, verses 31 to 37. I just want you to know that. Um, that same account is found there. So on this Sabbath day, um, Jesus went, which was his custom, to Capernaum. He went to the synagogue. And we know that the synagogue, when you look at the synagogue, it's, um, it's a word that's used just like church. Um, it, it refers to both the people and it refers to the, to the building. And the, li the word literally means to gather together. So during the time of Jesus, every Jewish community had a synagogue where people would gather together. And in the larger cities, they had more than one synagogue. The synagogue was supposed to be built on a big hill, the highest hill um, in the town. That's how the synagogue was to be built. And then on the east entrance that's where the entrance would be on the east side and it would be just like the temple in Jerusalem so it was something to be modeled like the temple in Jerusalem people would then gather on the Sabbath day to read scripture they would gather on the Sabbath day to offer prayers 
and they would gather on the Sabbath day um, to listen to a visiting rabbi, um, and they would come in and preach and teach the word. So Jesus came, and he's the visiting rabbi. He's coming in to, to teach, and the people were amazed at his teaching because of the authority that he had when he taught. Well, what, what does this mean? Um, the normal method of teaching during this time is when a rabbi would go into the synagogue and then would read the scripture, and then they would quote, and then they would compare different rabbis and what they would say. So it would be like I would hear what you would have to say, Sister Jackson, and then I would say, okay, I'm comparing this to what you say and compare it to what you say and compare it to what you say. So we got a whole bunch of comparisons and we can have a whole bunch of confusion about what's being said because there's different interpretations as to what was presented. And this is what would happen in the synagogues when different rabbis would come in there during Jesus's time, there was some, some confusion. Jesus did not follow this traditional method. When he was reading the word of God, he spoke with his own authority and his own interpretation. He wasn't saying, this is what you said, or this is what they said. He's saying, this is what God says, and he spoke with his own authority. And so when people heard him speaking, and they felt what was being said, and they could be able to see his authority and his power, they saw that this was different. Something was different about Jesus. And so they started asking the question, where did he get his authority to teach? Was it, was it from God? Was it from God? Mark chapter 1, verse 23. Just then a man in the synagogue was possessed by an evil spirit. He cried out, What do you want from us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus then spoke with authority and said, Be quiet, and said, come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were amazed and asked those questions. Is this a new teaching that he gives orders and the evil spirits obey him? So what took place to demonstrate the authority that Jesus had? He spoke to the demon. And it came out before he even spoke to the demon. How did, this demon spoke to him and said, we know who you are. He had authority. And as the demon recognized him for who he was, the power of God was resting on Christ. And he was showing everyone there that it is not about me. It's about God. And I have the authority and the power to be able to do anything because my father has sent me to do his business. And what happened? The man was delivered. You know what this tells me? That it doesn't matter how many traditional things we have to go through in our lives. It doesn't matter how many times or what we've been possessed by or those things that have a hold of us are those things that are holding us down and holding us back. You know what? If we continue to have faith and trust in God, he is able to break any stronghold that we have. Because even though the devil may have you, the devil knows that he is God. And the devil knows that he has the power. So we just have to surrender. And as we surrender and let God take the wheel, let him be the captain of our ship, guess what? He's able to heal, deliver, and set free. And if we would just put our faith and trust in him, he who is set free is free indeed. When we believe in the power of Christ, he can set us free from anything, any demonic attack any stronghold that we even place on ourselves, any addiction, any hurt, any trial, any trouble, he's able if we will simply believe in him. So his ministry is growing. His ministry is growing because of the authority and the power of his teaching, the authority and the power of his teaching. And now he's getting more disciples and people that are following him. To the call, the call of Matthew. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. 
And Jesus went on from there. After he just did what? He just delivered the man. He delivered the man that was um, that had a, uh, the demonic. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the. What did he say? And Matthew what? Once again, what did Matthew do? He followed him. Verse ten. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many what? And. What is this saying to us? What's the practical application of Matthew being who he was following Christ and then what happened when he came to Matthew's house? Okay. Matthew was a sinner just like everyone else. Well, he tried to stay away from sinners, but Jesus went to sinners. We mm. need to go where they are because they're not going to come where we are mm -hmm. and reach them with the word of God. Amen. Think about this. Matthew, tax collector, stealing money, tied his pockets, surrounded with crooks. He comes to realize who he is and the fact that he needed Christ. Once he saw that he needed Christ, he didn't then judge his other crooks. He saw that they were just as crooked as him, and they needed help. So he went and had a party to bring them in to introduce them to Christ. Y'all, we need to go to those, like you just said, those who are sinners. The truth is, all of us are sinners that have just been saved by grace. And so we need to go to those who need a Savior and be able to introduce them to the Savior. And we're not the Savior. We just need to make the introduction. Christ made the, um, Matthew made the introduction, but then Christ interceded and did the work. And that's what God wants us to do, to go out. The church is great for us to have people to come in, but y'all, we got to be able to go out because that's where you see so many people hurting. That's where we see so many people that have been disconnected and they're in the world. And we need to go in and show them to light and then let them know that God loves them so much that they too can be called out of darkness into the marvelous light of Christ. Levi had a great banquet for Jesus at his house. This is Luke's rendition. A large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But who? And the? Who belonged to? So you got people coming to see Christ who need Christ. And you got the teacher of the law, Pharisees, and they're set complaining to the disciples. Why do you eat and drink with and sinners? Jesus said, if it's not healthy, uh, it is not healthy. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come, I, I have, I can't talk. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Now we're coming, we're still in the same, the same vein of what just took place. Then John's disciples came and asked Jesus. So now in Matthew chapter 9, they're going back to how come, and this is following, you know, the, the, the I know we're going fast. This is following the direction we were in Matthew. The disciples, not John's disciples came and said, now, how is it that, we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples aren't fasting. How is it? How is that taking place, Jesus? Jesus says, how can the guest of the bridegroom mourn? Then he says,
Okay, so we had questions that they asked about Jesus. They asked Jesus about fasting. Um, when Jesus was questioned about um, not conforming to the uh, Jewish practice of fasting, what Jesus did was he compared his ministry to a wedding feast. He compared it to a wedding feast because everybody knew about weddings. Where did he perform his first miracle? The wedding. People knew about that. And weddings in Jesus' day were different than the weddings that we have today. So the couples in Jesus' day, they didn't go on honeymoons. They didn't go on honeymoons like we go on today. Um, rather, they stayed at home for an entire week. And while they stayed at home for that week, their, their house was open for a celebration. So people would come in and celebrate and celebrate and celebrate. And um, they would continue to feast and they would continue to rejoice. Um, this was like the best day or the best week of a man's life. Because, you know, you had an opportunity to be with your bride. You had all these guests coming in. Y'all were just eating, drinking, being merry, and having a good time. Um, those who came to the, um, to the feast, they were exempt from fasting if it was a time of fasting because it would lessen their joy of being able to have in their feasting. So they were exempt from that. And when Jesus says, when Jesus was questioned about why his disciples did not conform, he compared his ministry to a wedding fast. When the bridegroom ended the feast by his departure, then the practice of fasting would resume. So after they came in and they ate for that whole week, once the groom ended, by leaving and departing, now guess what? They would go back to, to fasting. In a like manner, Jesus' departure would bring his disciples a time when fasting would be what? Would be proper. So Jesus tells two short parables to show the incompatibility of his new message with that of, of Judaism. He made it clear that it did not come merely to reform Judaism, but to make all things. So he's basically saying, you got new wine. You take the new wine, and you can't put it in old wine skins. So you got this new kingdom of heaven I'm preaching and teaching, and what I'm bringing to you, the gospel, the good news, the kingdom of heaven is here. You, those old practices of Judaism, now I'm creating something new, and I'm taking that new wine and putting it, I can't put it in the same old stuff you had. Because if it goes into the same old way of you living and, and acting in your old traditions, guess what? It's going to burst out. He's saying, no, it's got to be put into new wine, new wine skins. And then he's saying, he got the patch. He's like, this stuff that you did with religions, y'all done messed it all up. And since you messed it all up, I got to now... I got to re-stitch and re sew and I got to put a cover over that which you did. So I got to re-stitch it because you distorted the Old Testament laws so bad, I couldn't just patch them up. I got to do something new. I got to do something new. So he's sharing this and how he's beginning to transform and shape from Judaism to let them know, look, there's something new coming. That same message that Christ was preaching over 2,000 years ago. And that was a blessing then. It's the same message he's preaching to us right now. And guess what? All of us are about to walk in the newness of life. All of us are about to go to a different level. Why? Because as the four disciples did, they trusted him. And we have to trust him and follow him. The demonic man, he was healed even though he did not ask for healing because of the love that God had for him. And you know what? God can take anything we're going through and turn it right side up, upside down, and work all things together for the good. Amen. Amen. Amen.